OK, then we'll kick off. I'm sure we'll have a few more join us uh, as we uh, continue the event. Uh, people obviously dining in uh, after work. Um, welcome everyone to the 10th Global Accessibility Awareness Day, the after party. Uh, GAD was last week. Uh, as you know, there was probably uh, hundreds of events that you were either attending at or so publicized and we're happy to continue the tradition. Um, I know our friends over at Accessibility London held a great remote event which I attended at and I was involved with two uh, internal events myself at work. We're going to go straight into the talks uh, this evening because we're very lucky to have, I mean, one of the few um, advantages, shall we say, of the current situation is that we've been able to engage speakers from outside the UK for our talk. So we're very lucky to have Eden with us from right here. But just before we start, just to let you know that we have captions available. So if you would like captions, please activate the closed captions button at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, I've also pasted a link in the chat, which will take you to a new browser window that allows you to customize and personalize um, the text in which the captions are displayed a little bit more. Uh, but also there is some functionality in Zoom to adjust the size of the captions. So just wanted to make you aware that um, that is available should you wish to follow the event with captions. I say we're very lucky uh, with us to have Eden from right here and he is going to talk about his experience in developing what looks like um, a fantastic product and is really addressing a really complex solution in accessibility. So I'm very pleased to introduce Eden from right here. Eden, if, over to you and if you'd like to share your screen. Of course, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I'll try to share my screen and I guess the permission for that, uh, but it's a pleasure, uh, pleasure being here. It's uh, 8 p.m. here in Israel and uh, see, share screen, no permission yet. Let me, I guess we'll have that, so no worries. Um, there you go, Eden, sorry, apologies for that. All right, no worries. All right, so here it is. Uh, Okay, just let me know that you can see it right now. And I will share it away like this. Do you see it right now? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. So again, my, it's a pleasure being here at UXPA UK. And thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me. As I said, my name is Idan. I'm 34 years old here in Israel, a father of two lovely kids. I studied psychology and business in the Open University here in Israel. And prior to right here, I've uh, co-founded the Habanana, which was one of the uh, hub startups here in Israel. It was a great school for me for understanding how to build uh, a startup company. And in the five, well, almost five uh, past years, I'm, uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of Right Here. And uh, I will explain more about Right Here in this uh, 20 or 25 minutes, as much as I have uh, uh, today with you. Uh, but it's not the goal. The goal is not talking about Right Here, what we're doing. I think the goal for me is talking mostly about uh, the, this new era of uh, accessible wayfinding uh, and obviously the challenges that we had uh, with the UX side of things because it's obviously a, a UX evening for all of us so uh, as part of this uh, uh, GAD initiative. So, um, so this is me, uh, a big part of my life is getting lost. Okay, I always getting lost. This is me getting lost in the nature this time. Uh, wherever I go uh, with friends or with, uh, with my family, if it's a, to a, a new to a vacation, to a new place, I'm usually the one that's the left thing about Idan, it's on the right, it's not on the left, Idan, when you go out to the elevators or things like that, I'm always getting lost. So I feel, I, I know from a very first hand, the frustration of not knowing where you are uh, or not necessarily knowing where to go. Um, for, again, almost five years ago, we thought that if we'll be able to solve such a challenge for those who have the biggest challenge, uh, when we thought if, if people who are blind and visually impaired, eventually I'll be able to solve my own challenge uh, of getting lost. Uh, the way we do what we do it right here very briefly is, is we basically developed an audible wayfinding system. We're going to show you in a minute how it's kind of looks and feels for a bit, just so we have context for the whole talk. But basically it's a system that uh, uh, run through an app 
uh, from the user perspective. It's also managed through the cloud. We're using beacons in, in the physical space. And let me just share with you one minute video of how it actually looks in action. And then I, I want to, dis to, again, to discuss mostly about what it means uh, having Audible Wayfinding System in a built environment and where it goes in the next few years, as well as on the UX challenges. We don't have a lot of time, so I'll start facing things up. Um, here we go, and I'm sharing, and I start it right away. Facebook, WhatsApp, right here. Welcome to McDonald's. You are next to the entrance door. To the counter, continue in this direction for 20 feet. The seating area is on your right and on your left. You are next to the counter. is right here. Okay, so, all right. So, what I want to discuss with you, this is just to give a, a bit of look and feel of what is that audible wayfinding system at all, for those of you who is the first time hearing about it. Uh, I would like to, in the next 20 minutes or so that I have, to talk about what we have for now in the present as in terms of uh, accessibility for people who are blind or visually impaired or with uh, severe, I would say, or significant orientation challenges, how the future is going to look like, what are the technologies that are available for that, what were the UX challenges that we faced with uh, at the beginning and even today, and a bit of case studies, and let's just, I kind of, as I said, pace things up uh, because of time. So. First, a little bit about numbers. If you're talking about people uh, with orientation challenges, according to our research, this is 5.4% of the population. Uh, and with under this umbrella of people with orientation challenges, we included people that have some cognitive disability that caught them to orientation challenge. Uh, of course, again, people who are blind or visually impaired, uh, but also people with different mental disabilities. This 5.4% of the population specifically in the US is around 18 million. So it's a lot of people out there that uh, just like me getting lost, but in a more, more significant way uh, than I do. Uh, what do we have uh, to offer to this, uh, or specifically to people who are blind or visually impaired in, in the built environment? So first, we have the tactile uh, and browse signage, which you can see on the left side on the screen. Uh, the problem with that uh, is that you need to know where the sign is, right, to be able to read it and, and touch it. And secondly, you not necessarily want to touch a public surface. And there are one more problem with Braille, which I'll disclose in a second. But the second to that, to the Braille signage or the tactile signage, we also have tactile paving, which you've seen on the floor, which allow a person basically knowing the direction, not necessarily where it leads to, uh, but there is a direction somewhere. Uh, so you might want to go through this line. Uh, and here's a, here's a very interesting fact that maybe some of you know, but uh, others might not. 90% of the blind community, even more than 90%, do not know to read Braille at all. Okay. So even if they were lucky enough to know where the sign is and brave enough to even touch it, again, with COVID-19 outside, uh, they won't necessarily know how to read it because, again, 90% of the blind community do not know to read Braille. Uh, so obviously, when you ask people who are blind or visually impaired, how do you operate in the world? How do you find your store in the mall? Or how do you find the doctor's clinic at the hospital? The answer is always with somebody. Again, their whole life is depending on others to be able to get from one place to another. Uh, and it's just absurd. We have, uh, we, in our team, we have Adi, is a software engineer and also uh, happened to be blind from birth. And when I asked him what is his main challenge at work, finding the office or finding the elevators. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and in the past year specifically, the, the need for, uh, I would say, independent way of finding uh, has increased dramatically, right? Because as I said, if they used to go with somebody, this somebody wasn't there in the past year. You had to find your way to do it yourself. Uh, there were no companions. So the need for audible wayfinding system or independent wayfinding uh, has increased dramatically just in the past year. And I, myself, and I think our team's thesis as well, is that audible wayfinding systems will be everywhere by 2025. 
Now, you know, nobody knows the future, not, not me as well, but this is our really strong assumption and we have a few evidence to that that I'd like to share with you before we get into the, the bits and bytes of how, how we do that. But there are a few assumptions where we believe that in the next few years, uh, audible wayfinding system will be everywhere. So one is precedent regulation in other countries. Here in Israel, having talking signs or audible wayfinding system is already regulated. You have to have it. This is one of the reasons we've been able to grow so well in the past few years, because businesses, whether if it's a mall, whether if it's a stadium, whether if it's an office building, you name it, has to have some sort of audibly wayfinding system. That could be a speaker, that could be something else, but they have to have it. Of course, not in everywhere around the building. In Israel, it's only in the entrances, next to information centers, next to elevators, but still you have to have them. And we believe that this type of regulations or compliant will go into more countries. We've seen that happening online with online accessibility, which is discussed a lot. I'm pretty sure also here, we've got, we're have we expecting to see regulations in the field also in the physical environment where it's needed. Again, we're still humans, we're not robots. So as much as it's important to have the digital sphere accessible, it is equally important to have the physical sphere also accessible. So this is one, the regulation is one, uh, I would say evidence for this thesis. The second one uh, is the speed of technology development. Right, so why don't we see anything like like that in, in you know out there? Why do we see only braille signs? Because that's what technology has to offer in the past thirty years for that, or even more. But in I believe in the ten last years, we all see that the the speed of technology development is rapidly increasing and increasing. And I put here this image of the Boston Dynamics uh, dog, which I guess some of you are familiar with. Who knows? That might be the next guiding dog. I mean, you think about it, technology is changing very, very fast. Uh, just like we are now developing our own next generation of the system, pretty sure there are other technologies that are coming more and more available and therefore the cost for them is usually also decreasing and therefore the need is, is, is there. And when you combine them two, you have another reason why it will be so ubiquitous. The third reason, uh, and I will end with that, is they increasing uh, in awareness for inclusion and, and accessibility in general. This specific event is part of this GAD, Global uh, Accessibility Awareness Day, it's, which is celebrating 10 years. See what happened in the past 10 years. See, what, see how it's getting more and more in, into people's awareness and how it's become more, more dominant in the discussions. Uh, so as I said, the awareness around uh, uh, inclusion and accessibility is rising. And it's another reason why in the next two, three, maybe four years, uh, most businesses and, 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 and in general public spaces will understand that they have to have something like that. I'm sorry that for running so fast that I do want to kind of cover as much things as I can. So uh, Chris, you tell me if I'm running too fast or if it's, ever, if it's okay. I want to kind of cover really quick about the technologies a little bit. So there's many different positioning technologies out there. Uh, I uh, kind of pick up three, only three main ones that are, when I say main ones, that are the most in use or more available, most available, more uh, uh, popular. So one is the iBeacon technology, which is basically best based on Bluetooth. Uh, the other one is Wi-Fi, uh, and thirdly is, I would say, camera-based type of solutions which identify the environment through uh, computer vision. Uh, to summarize the good and bad of all of these, I kind of allow myself to put this in the table. Uh, I don't think we need to get too drill down to it because I wanted to discuss other things, but I'm happy to share this presentation later with whoever would like that. Uh, talking a little bit about the camera-based type of solutions and from the US, UX, but not necessarily only UX perspective, also from other perspectives, there are privacy issues uh, that is part of that. Imagine a person uh, with, uh, like me here, with a smart glass and a camera that is on that helping him go out, out and about to different places. Sounds cool, sounds great, but uh, you not, might not necessarily want it to be uh, uh, together with you when you go to the restrooms. Uh, and you might not necessarily consider it as accessibility to be relying on someone else on the other side of the camera if it's like a remote type of assistant uh, as well. Um, I'll move forward again, uh, just because I want to cover as, as much as I can. As, one of the main challenges around uh, audible wayfinding systems is the mapping challenge. 
uh, when you think about a, a wayfinding system, you basically need to have a, 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 the map and the positioning of the person on that map. So in the indoor environment, obviously outdoors we have GPS, we all know that and probably using it, but in the indoor environment, uh, we don't have the maps you are always available. Uh, there are different projects by Google and others who try to map the indoor spaces of the world, but with as many technology it can be, it, it will take more time. We, we, it is, as we said, it takes time because you have to be there to map it out. Uh, and that's a physical uh, uh, kind of barrier to that. Um, specifically in our case, and right here, we're using the layout that the business or the venue already has. And based on that, we identify the different points of interest. Uh, so just to, to let you know, we've discussed about the technologies before, the iBeacon, the Wi-Fi, the camera-based. They are great for positioning, but there is still the challenge of the mapping. Uh, there are so many opportunities with the new reality of Audible Wayfinding System that we've been able to, to be exposed to, to experience. Uh, uh, I, will, I, won't, I won't kind of share all of their experiences and testimonials. Uh, this is a D, by the way, which I mentioned earlier, it was working with us, but it could be from, from the workspace towards the daily life in, in, in retail or shopping in a mall or a specific pharmacy in this case. And even before that, through the public transportation, being able to identify the bus station and, and all your way toward your uh, desired destination. Um, happily, in our case, right here, we've been able to do that in different in, uh, environments. Uh, this one specifically is a shared space in France that we've done the, the system installed. And when you think about it, you know, Again, back from accessibility in mind, a lot of times the discussion is, is on the digital sphere. We're all aware of that. But how can you really expect a person to work in a, whatever job it is uh, if he cannot find himself uh, the restrooms, for example? It's, it's a basic need, right? Being, or being able to find a certain uh, uh, meeting room. So we believe that by turning, having wayfinding system installed in the workplace, right? We truly, not necessarily us right here, but as, as, a, as a category, we truly uh, pushing this uh, inclusion forward uh, and answering basic needs of, of uh, a very uh, a big, I would say, population. So here's an example in, in a shared space. Uh, we've done that also in restaurants. This is a picture from a restaurant in, in San Diego specifically. Uh, and I put here inclusion is also being uh, social. Uh, a lot of times in, in coffee shops or in restaurants, you go there not just because you're hungry, you go there because you wanna be uh, socialized with other people. Uh, and again, think about it if it's a date or if it's uh, just a meeting with friends, you know, being able to be part of, the, of this event or, or getting there or, or feeling equally uh, uh, like everyone else there, you need to have audible wayfinding system. So it's another, another example for that. Uh, another interesting example uh, is this one from a universal design perspective. In this picture, you can see uh, Ohad. Ohad is uh, one of our users who used the app, but as he, he have a great site. He had no challenges with site, but he's using our solution uh, as a supermarket because one of the features that we have there is to call for local assistance. So if Ohad cannot reach a certain shelf, it just calls somebody who will help him in, in a specific task. So it's still not a full accessibility in terms of he's not fully independent, but they have more and more tools to use to reach that ultimate or oh, ideal independence in his daily lives. So uh, I want you to remember when you when talking about audible wayfinding systems, we're not only talking about people who are blind or visually impaired, or even necessarily people with orientation challenges, we're talking about, again, everybody uh, uh, that might need to use certain features, whether if it's a call for local assistant, whether if just hearing the information in his own language. Right? Think about yourself, If uh, maybe some of you have been to Israel. If you go to a lot of places in Israel, all the signs are only in Hebrew, right? So you might see perfectly, you might also be able to read perfectly, but if you don't know the language, you might find yourself lost. I would like to discuss a little bit of the UX challenges that we face because again, it's a UX event. So um, I, will, I will name a few. So one is the first, first challenge that we had is the hands-free challenge. 
all of our system is, uh, is based on, on an app in a smartphone. And when you think about our users, many of them using guide dogs or a YK. So one hand is already taken for, for avoiding obstacles, again, whether if it's the guide dog or the white can. And then the other hand is holding the, the, the smartphone. You, you, you basically, you cannot, you cannot use your hands all of a sudden. So this hands-free challenge is a big challenge for us because we want the system to be hands-free, uh, whether if it's through this picture here on, on uh, smart watches, but not all of them, all, all of, not everyone have a smart watch uh, and not all functionalities have been able to be functional on the smart watch when we just started. So that's just one of the, the challenges that we were facing with this hands-free uh, uh, challenge. Another challenge that we were facing with and realized that is the, the, the struggle or the challenge of going straight in a very far distance, okay? Try to imagine yourself uh, closing your eyes and going to a hundred meters distance uh, so towards a certain destination. You might start to go, you know, slightly right or slightly left and not necessarily directly uh, straight ahead. Uh, to be able to overcome that, I'll give you an example of how we kind of address that. We put this sky mode feature in the app, so which basically means that once a user is turning his uh, device from a uh, horizontal uh, hold to a vertical hold, what the app will basically do is, is kind of sticking into a certain uh, direction that the user is facing to. And whenever the user is slightly right or left, we kind of uh, uh, alert him on that with vibration or sound. So, in th th so for example, if it's in the uh, entrance to a certain building, it might hear that in this, towards the west, there are the uh, information center. It would like to go there. If it's a hundred meter distance, it will just take his a smartphone from a, a horizontal hold to a vertical hold, and then it can just go there. And whenever he changes uh, his direction, we will help him fix that in the back on route. Another challenge that we have in small, probably mostly locally here, is with the text to speech in Hebrew. Uh, it doesn't work well as it is in English. Uh, and it's in as much as it might be uh, uh, surprising, most of our users are already used to have the different uh, nuances with the Hebrew text to speech. Uh, but it was very hard for our customers, or well, buildings owners or venues owners, to, to hear that. They were like, well, how can you say my brand in this uh, way in, in Hebrew, for example, it doesn't sound like my name. Yes, this is true, but this is how your users uh, or our users, or this is how popula this population is already used to hear your name in, you know, in the online newspaper, for example. This is how the text to speech is already functioning. So it was more of the mainstream challenge to, adopt, to, to realize that rather than our uh, end users. Uh, challenge, but it's still a challenge from our side as, as a business to, to deal with. Another challenge I would like to share with you is the recording feature. The recording feature is basically one of the features that allow our users to landmark uh, a, a certain point of interest in, in space and in, in the outdoor space, actually. So imagine if I would like to go uh, to a friend, for example, and there is an intersection. And each time in this intersection, I will turn right and turn in, instead of turning left. Okay. So next time I'll be there, I can record myself. Idan, please turn left and not right. Please turn left. So then the next time I'll be there, I'll get this prompt of Idan, this is where you need to turn left. Kind of a, a memo, audible memo, which is location based as well. This is the feature. Now, what was the challenge is GPS is not that accurate as we used to have in indoor. So this is still a challenge that we're still facing with. We have different ways of solving it and I'll, I'll name one. What we've done is uh, whenever the signal from the GPS is not accurate enough, this feature is just not functioning anymore. Uh, and when it's, you do have a great uh, uh, satellite signals, so this feature is available for you. Therefore, the accuracy of the GPS is better and your, your experience will be better. Uh, so this is another challenge we had. Uh, lastly, I will, I will uh, share with you one of the main challenges that we had in the beginning. We kind of feel like we've been able to make a, a very big pr progress there, but still have some challenges, is the audible descriptions themselves. Right? When, you, when you would like to describe a person, uh, his, his environment around him, that require a lot of challenges, right? So for example, let's take a look at the picture now on the slide of this lady entering to a building. You might not necessarily think to let her know 
that the doors are automatic sliding doors, right? Because if, if you're a sighted person, you just see it and you take it for granted that you will get it towards that, you'll recognize that and will continue. But for a blind person, that's a very important information to know. If you won't tell him that there is a sliding door, automatic sliding door there, he will just miss the entrance. You want to understand where, where is that in space? So uh, no, putting attention to what should be mentioned, what should be described and how uh, it's also go through, you know, distances. In the beginning, we were talking about go towards this direction, 20 steps. And then we realized steps are different from different people. So for the tall one, it's only five steps, but for the shorter one is, is, is way more than that. So we've changed it to meters, but again, in other countries, it should be feet. So today our users can just uh, pick up whatever they prefer, whether if it's a feet or metric. Uh, but uh, this type of uh, challenges that we had with the descriptions themselves are still challenging us. And I think there is a great know-how within it. We're all, by the way, familiar with uh, audio descriptions for movies. Right? Uh, there's there's a profession of being uh, uh, audible, uh, being able to uh, sorry a profession of audio descriptions for movies. Uh, we believe that same prof professionality around it will be also for describing the physical environment as well. Um, maybe two suggested takeaways, and I will end with that. Uh, first, uh, again, we believe that uh, audible wayfinding system should and will be everywhere. Uh, I think why, why it should be everywhere is clear to everyone, uh, but the fact that it's actually happening and will be everywhere is not that clear. Uh, time will tell, but this is our, our thesis. Uh, and, and secondly, to be able to get to that reality where it's everywhere and everyone could feel included uh, in, the, in the physical space or in public spaces. Um, there is a lot of awareness and professional activism uh, to get that. Uh, and I know, I guess, that the part of you are working for companies or working for towards different uh, products. Uh, I'm kind of invite you to encourage your places to think about it, to have, to make sure that your physical space is accessible as much as your digital uh, uh, assets uh, as well. A lot of discussions, as I said, are on the digital sphere, not enough on the physical. We're still human, so keep that in mind. Um, happy to stay in touch. Chris, I, I hope it was uh, not too fast, but I've tried to put as much as I could into these 25 minutes. Thank you, Eden. That was great. And it's certainly wayfinding is something I struggle with myself. There are very few um, tube stations in London I can actually get out of an exit without having to then turn on Google Maps to figure out whether I need to go left, right, uh, or straight on. Um, are you okay to take a few questions if we have them? I know sure, of course. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, of course. Happy to take any questions. I'd like to open the floor to questions if you want to use the Q&A panel or raise your hand in the participants channel. But, or in the participants panel, sorry. But if not, I will kick off. I have a couple. Um, how did you get from the kind of the initial concept to the product where it is now? I mean, have you been working with um, users on a constant basis, um, you know, with every iteration? How yes, that yes, uh, uh, absolutely. So in the very beginning, uh, we, we had no clue of how even people who are blind uh, using smartphone at all. Like we had to learn so much. And uh, we met a lot of, uh, a lot of people we even joined them to our team in different stages to be part of it. And we also today have people who are blind and visually impaired in the team. And even, even our name, not a, not a lot of people know that, but even our name right here is like a self reminder for us that the right thing to do is to hear, but basically to listen to the end users. We do not understand the needs and the interest uh, as our end users are. Uh, so absolutely, we're evolving that from the very beginning. I've mentioned Adi in my talk, and Adi is, has a very unique combination of understanding the technology behind it, because he's a software engineer himself, and also understanding the need as a blind person from birth. So uh, having him together with us as a product strategist is, uh, I think, is a great uh, asset that we have. And uh, even today, every new feature, before we launch it up, uh, we have close uh, beta group users that we discuss with them. We let them try it first, uh, having their feedback and based on that, uh, uh, continue forward. I have, I have another one and it's about 
offices. I know when we spoke um, before this event, um, I mentioned where I work and the challenges of the layout on every floor is often the same. Or, uh, But what we're seeing now is that offices are moving towards flexible workspaces where the layout might change from week to week or month to month. Right. Have you considered how to address that solution or are you currently able to address that that, that problem? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so the way, as it, and I have mentioned before, we have uh, basically three main components. One is the app. The secondly is the beacon that we are installing in the venue. And then thirdly is the online dashboard. And with the online dashboard, us and also the, the facility manager can control, edit, and manage all the audible descriptions that later on will be audibly displayed to our users. So usually when we put in the audio descriptions, and again, there are a lot of challenges, challenges around that, but when we put them in, this, in the system, we've tried to put the information that won't change very often. For example, the elevators will stay at the same place probably for a long, long time, as well as the, the main entrances, the restrooms, and things like that. So obviously, if uh, an office, if Chris' office is now in this room, and maybe next month it won't be Chris' office anymore, but someone else's office or whatever, something like that, uh, this is, can be changed through the online dashboard. Uh, the challenge with that, by the way, is maintaining it from, from the, the management around the facility. But we, we believe first that it's easier to change it online. The, this, you know, think about it right here a lot of, a lot of way in, in a, like an audible sign, right? So you also need to change the sign on this room all of a sudden, right? It's not Chris' office anymore. It's Phil's process, uh, room, for, for, for example, right? So you need to change the sign there. You need to print it. You need to, to hang it. We already used to that where we're doing some changes in the facility. In right here's case, you don't need to do anything aside of going to this online portal and change it in, in the text, clicking save, and that's it. So in that perspective, it's easier, but what is difficult is remembering that and putting that into the awareness of the facility to do that. Um, so yeah, there are still challenges with that, but it's, it is, it is uh, for those companies that we work with who care about it, it is working pretty well to, to maintain it. We do have a, ooh, we have two more questions. So one in the Q&A panel, um, did you only do research with visually impaired participants and how was the research process? No, not only, but in, well, well, it depends when, <laughs> when we just started, we, yes, in the very, very beginning, it was actually only people who are blind, not even visually impaired, only people who are blind. We were looking only for uh, total total blind. Uh, again, in, the, in later stage, we've done that with, Today we done it not necessarily even with people with visual impairment, but also with other orientation challenges, as I mentioned earlier. Sometimes it's cognitive or, or even mental, uh, uh, because again, as the way we see it, you know, uh, the, this whole system is to provide independent, and it's part of it is from the wayfinding side of things. But there are other aspects of accessibility in the built environment that we put into it. Uh, how the research process goes? Uh, we, in the, in the beginning, we've just invited, or even today, we're inviting uh, a certain number, usually it's around 10. Uh, we've tried to do it more than that, but we don't always have the, the, the ability to reach more than that. Uh, around 10 users, we interview them, then we let them try some, uh, uh, if we already have some prototyping of what we have in mind. Uh, and, and this is usually how we iterate. We launch it, get the feedback, and launch, uh, launch a new one. So it's kind of it's an iterating, iterated uh, process all the all the way. Um, I, I hope it's answered the the question. There is another question I think by Anita here. Chris, do, do you want to maybe read it out? Uh, I think Phil had a question. So, sorry, I think Phil had a question. Oh, first. Phil, had, sorry, you you go, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to know what the, the response of the um, individual organisations that you're dealing with, because um, you, you sort of mentioned it at the end there. Um, do, do, they, do they respond well? Is there a sort of overarching response that they will have? or is it, so, is it... Yeah, so, you know, it's a good point. It's, it's, uh, it also depends which, which company, which brand, and, all, and, and when. So in the very, very beginning, it was really, really hard. And, and even today, when we're starting to penetrate a new market, specifically the UK, for example, we didn't, have, we didn't find yet, unfortunately, the, the, the pioneer. 
we usually try to find a very well reputed uh, uh, brand to work with once they do it others are following but finding the first one to believe in that and adopting that that's the hardest challenge so, uh, so as i said it depends in, in what sectors uh, we feel that there is more of uh, care uh, around that in for example the education uh, sector uh, less of that in other sectors uh, but it also depends on the stages and and we've seen that happening here in israel it's, it's kind of like a, a snowball when, when it starts so it starts and, and and it's and it's growing and others are following and joining this uh, but having the first are always the, the most challenging part of it and, and by the way i mentioned that in my talk i truly believe that in in a few years time it will become required so there will basically no way around that you'll, you'll just be obligated you know by by different uh, uh, accessibility regulations to have something like that so we hope that we'll push that forward as well. I, I realize we're running behind schedule, but I think we just have that one last question from sure. Anita. Um, and it's about where do you get the, your users as test participants? Because uh, we all know that can be quite challenging. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So there are two ways. So, so again, it depends on the, on, the, on the time. But in the beginning and even today, we're working to very closely with the uh, blind uh, organizations. And uh, not just in Israel, by the way, also actually in the UK, RNIB or Henshaws in, in north of, uh, of the UK. Uh, and thanks to them, we are able to reach a certain groups of users. When we meet, meet with them, we share with them our vision. Uh, I think at, at the end of the day, it's a 100% free solution for them. Uh, it always has been, it always will be. And we kind of share with them that to be able to have the world more accessible, we need to work together with our community, with our end users to bring it up uh, to, to, the, to everywhere. Um, so first through, through the, the blind organization, and then I think we're doing a very good job in um, create, cre I would say connecting them to the vision and to the mission. Um, so we have you know, many WhatsApp groups already around that and Facebook group, and where we discuss the different ideas, challenges, uh, and feedback. So that's the way we do that. Thank you. That's great. Uh, Eden, I'd like to wish you a good evening. We'll let you go now. We realize it's late over there. I believe the app is available in the UK and you can demonstrate it. If you check, check several locations, I've, I've had a, a look at it. So uh, we hope to hear from you uh, again soon and see the progress as the app develops. So I'd like to wish you a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Happy to invite you all connecting me and asking more questions if you have later. And till next time, have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. So just before I introduce our, our next speaker, a few years ago I was working at, um, at Vodafone, and I can talk about this because actually the product never launched in the UK. And we were developing a TV service. So Vodafone um, was developing an over-the-top TV service similar to what you might find for Sky. And they said to me, OK, Chris, can you do the accessibility policy? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. And they were like, okay, so our package contains uh, a TV remote control, a set-top box, uh, an EPG. Um, it has uh, packaging with set-up instructions, uh, and we need you to make all that ac accessible. And all of a sudden, I realized something that I thought should have been relatively straightforward wasn't. And part of the reason was that we were relying a lot on the capabilities of the TV devices themselves. So no matter what we put into the EPG, to make it accessible. It all was dependent on the device itself. And one thing that Phil is going to talk about, uh, a challenge I'm sure we've all experienced, is the TV remote control. Over to you, Phil, if you'd like to share your screen. Hi guys. Um, so um, thanks, Chris, for uh, running this event. Um, I've, uh, my name's Phil Robertson. Um, I've been working um, in technology quite some time. Um, I've grown up with it. Uh, a lot of the toys that I had as a kid uh, here in the background, this is not a fake background. These are real tangible computers from the 80s. Um, I, my father was a um, computer engineer, so he used to bring um, large mainframe computers home and let me play with them as a six, seven, eight-year-old um, and then I, I switched to the BBC by the time I was nine, um, was into programming by the time I was 10, 11. Um, 
and have used computers all that, that time. Um, and uh, one thing that has always interested me is, is the um, scalability of, of technology, the ability for um, it to be more ubiquitous. And um, I realized around about the time I was 18, 19, I was working in recording studios and um, I, I realized just how difficult some pieces of technology were to use. And then when the iPad came along and people who were significantly younger and significantly older were starting to use it, that's when I sort of woke up to accessibility. Um, so I've uh, worked in many large organizations. I've actually defined out the accessibility standards for Diageo, uh, Thomson Reuters, UBS, um, Johnson & Johnson, um, and we'll continue to do so. And I'm, I'm happy to see that um, accessibility standards are actually becoming um, a common practice amongst designers, not just um, a legal requirement that people uh, feel they need to meet. Um, one thing that sort of younger um, designers ask me, how do I get better at design? Um, if you're genuinely stuck, I would say, um, look at accessibility as a, as a design uh, a, a practice. Um, it will improve your design skills. Um, so what I want to go through is the four areas of accessibility. Uh, and I want to explain why they make us better, better designers. Um, I've also got a bit of a case study to do with capture. Um, this is something that Chris and I were both talking about. Um, and then I'm going to go over the, uh, the new Samsung remote. Um, with, I worked as part of the research team, um, on this very briefly, um, not as, as a designer. Um, so the four areas of accessibility, um, are visual, physical, auditory and cognitive. Um, now the reason why, uh, accessibility isn't just something that we do, um, as a legal requirement or as an inclusive way to design is because not all um, accessibility issues are uh, due to the fact that they could be permanent. Um, someone who has you know, a visual impairment, um, it can be temporary or it could be situational. So um, when we look at visibility, um, we have permanent visibility conditions. Some people just wear glasses um, and they have uh, poor eyesight. Other people have various um, color blindnesses. There are many different color deficiencies, but the, the, there are some that are more prominent than, than others. Um, recently, in fact, after I put this uh, presentation together, somebody showed me um, a plugin for uh, a, an app called Storybook, which is a UI development tool that actually will simulate all of the different um, uh, color deficiencies. Um, so you can open up your component or your interface, you run the plugin and it will simulate the condition. Uh, and it will also tell you uh, how far you've gone along the WCAG accessibility standards. Um, there's also people like ourselves who t are temporarily um, in a situation where we might have an eye, inju an eye injury, um, some people uh, are more sensitive to flashing objects. This is very common in uh, car accidents. People say that uh, they crash their car because they're, they're, they're glinting. Um, other people um, under extreme motion or vibration find that they are unable to read properly. Um, there's also situational. Uh, you could just simply be in a very shiny um, environment with a shiny screen. This is a big complaint of um, uh, glossy versus matte uh, screen finishes. Um, you can also have visual overload. A lot of the time, some interfaces uh, aren't considerate of the users. Um, so you get a lot of visual overload uh, and this will put users at a, a, a loss, even if they have um, no requirements at all. Um, there's also what they call the secondary task or blocked view. Um, again, another common one from cars is the idea that you have something that's temporarily blocking your view. Um, they say, you know, don't park cars on corners because people can't see around them. Um, so as you can see, even regardless of whether, um, what our situation is, if we take into consideration these um, 
permanent, temporary and situational um, moments in our design, <clears throat> we'll be able to design products that actually um, work better. If we go across to physical, um, we do have people with um, congenital conditions, motor skills and joint disorders. Um, as we move across into temporary, um, this can just be somebody who simply has a, a hand injury. Um, and again, motion and vibration um, can affect people, um, but also when people are temporarily ill um, or they could be uh, intoxicated. Uh, a lot of the time people worry about the comment section of certain websites, um, but they don't take into consideration that at the time, maybe that person was intoxicated when they made the comment. Um, we also have situational. Um, so mums, new mums, generally tend not to put the babies down. So they've only got access to one hand. Um, people who are reclining because they're just tired. Uh, and then there is a quite a common problem within kiosk work. And this is um, in public spaces. Uh, people who are very tall often complain that uh, cash machines and ticket machines um, are unusually low for them. Uh, and people who are in uh, wheelchairs or who are just very short uh, find that they're too high. So um, we have to make sure that when we're designing um, away from the computer out in public spaces that we take these into consideration as well. If we move over to auditory, um, we can see that we've got things like full hearing loss and partial hearing loss. Um, this is a, a fantastic area of um, not just accessibility but design in general. Uh, a lot of companies are now moving into this. I'll, I'll show you an example later on with um, Samsung. Um, but as voice activated interfaces are coming along, this is splitting off into its own area of, of UX now. Um, voice commands and um, assisted hearing devices are really sort of driving the forefront of that. So it's a, it's a great area to get into um, right now. We've also got temporary auditory conditions, which is um, people with ear, ear infections um, or somebody who's just been required to wear safety clothing, um, protective ear protectors. Um, and then you can have situational as well. So um, if you're in a loud environment, such as a bar, um, you might not be able to hear very well. Um, big complaint amongst Zoom users is uh, audio dropout, um, poor internet connections. Um, and then the final one is, is heavy accents. Um, I don't know if many of you are aware, but uh, Siri had a strong problem with Scottish accents when it first came out. Um, a lot of Scottish people did not like Siri at all. Um, it would understand English accents, all of the variations fairly well, but when it came to Scotland, um, it, it failed quite a lot. So I want to talk um, a little bit about how we realise this in, in uh, the real world when we're dealing with accessibility um, and all the different conditions that people have, um, how this is, has um, become a problem um, with people who use um, assist, assisted devices or have conditions um, and they get blocked. And a, a classic example is the world of security. Um, Capture was um, originally um, bought in in order to stop um, automated bots uh, creating accounts, um, generating um, feeds and commentary. Um, there have been quite a few iterations on it um, and it's not been great. Um, I think the first uh, version of Capture that I came across um, that was installed on our uh, platform for Sainsbury's back in, I think, 2009, actually ended up taking the entire site down. Um, so the technology wasn't very good when it first rolled out and it hasn't really got much better since then. Um, so if we look at what users say um, about all of the different um, capture forms, um, we can see that they fail quite, quite obviously. Um, I think, you, some of you will have seen these examples online yourself, but um, I've just highlighted some of the biggest offenders. So uh, the number one is the picture capture where it asks you uh, to select squares with street signs and there's nothing in them. Um, there's also uh, visually baff baffling um, examples. Um, this one here was 
prove you're not a robot, click on the animals in the image below, and then some sort of abstract mess. Um, there was a recent report done into dyscalculia. Um, it's quite common. Um, about 35% of um, adults uh, suffer from some form of uh, fairly high level dyscalculia. Um, but 70% uh, of adults say that they really don't like um, being given numeric tasks in general. Um, so a lot of the time you can get just failure from the general public with uh, maths tests that, that come in. Um, there's also um, some terrible examples of uh, scrawly text that come up. Microsoft was particularly bad with this one, um, where they would choose an inappropriate font and then they twist it around and those fonts could could potentially change the meaning um does that say barrymore or does it say balmy more um it's not using english uh words so it's not like you can refer to a spelling standard um these these really fail poorly with um uh, people with dyslexia as well um there is also screen readers that people use uh, who have uh, visual impairment. Um, they fail terribly. In fact, uh, a lot of the time, um, in order for bots to um, uh, be put off accessing the, um, the audio option, they'll put distortion into the actual audio itself. Um, so these are two comments that were, were made by users. Um, it can be really hard to hear the message since it's got to be distorted enough so that computers can't figure it out. Um, the screen reader audio starts playing before you can find the input text field. And because screen readers are driven by audio, um, you don't know when you're actually in focus. Um, so the focus should be put on the field before you actually um, input your text, and often it isn't. Um, Webnographer did a, an online usability test of um, all the different uh, capture systems out there. 62% um, of users um, completed capture on the first try. So as you can see, there's a big chunk of users there that don't actually um, get the capture. Um, 23 struggled through multiple attempts uh, and then 15% gave up entirely. So if your organization is uh, working and they're suggesting that they put a capture on the page, um, just know that 15% of your users is just going to give up and, and a, a, another large chunk of them are not going to be happy uh, that you've put it on there. Um, somebody has said to me, you know, what are the solutions to that? Uh, well, we'll talk about that in a bit. There's, there are um, multiple ways to get around cap capture and there are other, other technologies out there. Um, I just want to go over a, an example of what it's like um, to use uh, capture this is um what they call recapture from google this was a response to the fact that capture itself was relatively failed technology <clears throat> and it was cutting off a lot of users so um somebody made this uh video to show what it's like using a screen reader with the new and improved recapture Tab, tab, toolbar, refresh, left, fair, and F5, tab, Google, tab, toolbar, home, tab, recapture, link, tab, by zero, underline, one, four, one, seven, seven, three, two, zero, three, five, five, eight, four, frame, tab, I'm not a robot, checkbox, not checked, tab, unverified, tab, privacy, link, tab, shift, tab, shift, tab, unver, shift, tab, I'm not a robot, space, partially checked, I zero, underline, one, four, one, seven, seven, three, two, zero, three, five, five, eight, four, frame, I zero, underline, one, four, one, seven, seven, three, two, zero, three, five, five, eight, four, frame, opening challenge. So as you can see there, um, this video does go on and it gets worse. Um, it's, it's not great. Uh, so we have to ask ourselves, what are the responses um, if somebody's saying that they want capture on the site? Well, here's six. Um, I've seen a lot more. Uh, there are plenty of websites out there that uh, will um, show you different methods. It entirely depends on the technology and the platform you're using. Um, one that I've personally used and liked was called Data Dome. Um, it's invisible. Uh, it sits on your website and it looks to see if the mouse is moving in certain ways and the keyboard is actually being pressed. Um, the scroll is being used in a way that a human would scroll. 
and that the page is being interacted with as though a, a genuine user uh, would use it. Um, as a result, it is extremely accurate uh, and detects 98% of um, bot behavior, um, but it's also um, extremely re reliable at, at um, understanding when humans are on there. It, there are configurable options where if it doesn't think you're human because you just so happen to be an extremely fast typer and scroller um, with superhuman abilities, um, it might then inject um, a, a capture form, um, but in general, it, it um, actually only shows any security options um, less than 0.01% of the time. So Datadome is a great product. Um, there's capture skip which is um, basically a, a phone verification. Uh, so it's, it's, it's two-step verification. Two-step verification is becoming a lot more popular because of the fact that it, it is one of the more successful security um, methods. Uh, Google has kicked in two-step uh, across its um, platforms now, and it will ask you to, to, to two-step verify um, instead of doing um, captures. And this is from the company that eventually uh, originally pioneered the capture system. Uh, there's also biometric and face IDs. Um, these are great for logging into apps, but they're also um, great ways that if you're building um, uh, anything for mobile and you can access the face ID or the biometrics, um, do so because people um, have always got a face or a finger. Um, there is SMS uh, two-factor as well. This is a um, uh, very similar um, to the capture skip. Um, this is where you physically get a code in the SMS itself, and then that auto-populates um, into um, the actual object that you've you've programmed um, because it will be connected via the account. There's a, a thing called a honeypot method. Um, this is a field that is hidden from the user. Um, it's actually physically there, but it's underneath a, um, a white square. Um, and bots can't see that there's a white square there. Um, so it's hidden using CSS. Um, and the display itself um, uh, gets picked up by bots. And if it gets filled in, um, the user then is rejected. Uh, and then finally, um, just get rid of it. There's, uh, if, if you, you're getting highly spammed or there's a lot of act, fake activity coming onto your site, um, then, you know, try a different technology, but th there's a very strong argu argument for just getting rid of recapture. Um, usability wise, it, it, it doesn't offer um, that much security. And uh, an instance where we took off a capture for Unilever, um, who have a you know extremely large offering. Um, we actually found out that we only got spam and bots um, in very minimal amounts of, ca of cases, and we were actually able to just go into the email accounts and delete the junk. Um, we set up junk filters, and that caught a lot of it. Uh, so we we didn't actually get anything from capture um, or recaptures we, we we were using at the time. So we just found that actually just getting rid of it was um, was probably best. Secondly, I want to move into um, the case study of um, the remote control. The remote control is a, an extremely ubiquitous piece of technology. Um, it's one of the most hated objects in the house, um, mostly because people either lose them, but also um, I think it was um, a, a research group looked into how many people actually knew um, what the functionality was uh, on their remote controls and the results were pretty poor. Uh, most people couldn't name at least seven buttons on the actual interface. Um, a large swathe of them uh, only knew what a fraction of them did. And as you can see in the middle here, we've got an example of uh, responses to um, elderly parents trying to use the TV. Um, so their siblings or someone around them has come in and basically gaffer taped over the buttons that they don't need to use uh, and it's quite a lot of the remote control. Um, to the right here is Apple's second response to the remote. Um, their last uh, remote was meant to be revolutionary but in fact 
even Apple failed at this one. And the uh, the last Apple TV remote was genuinely seen to be uh, a bit of a failed object. So um, when we were doing our research at Samsung, we actually realized that, um, you know, if Apple can't get this right, then we were going to have a struggle as well. So when we looked at the standard Samsung remote, uh, one thing that Samsung had done was try to simplify it um, to reduce it down. There are standard requirements across all remote controls, uh, and that is this um, central wheel um, layout. You'll find it on 95% of TV remote controls. But in general, the remote itself um, still suffered, um, even color coding the buttons trying to break the buttons um, out into different patterns, uh, didn't test well. Um, when we asked users what their complaints were, they would say, well, they're easy to use, the buttons are confusing, the icons don't seem to make sense. Um, a lot of buttons contain no affordance with their features, so users would simply press them to see what happened. Um, one of the other things that, that was quite um, specific, Samsung, was their 72 page manual that came with the television um, with some of the tiniest print I've ever seen. Uh, we did actually have to get the magnifying glass out just to read parts of it. Um, the manuals also aren't necessarily device specific. So um, a lot of the time manuals that are written for functionality of TV that is accessible from the uh, remote itself um, just isn't quite in enough detail. And in some instances, menus will render themselves differently from what's shown in the manual. Um, there are buttons on the uh, remote controls that have no functionality whatsoever. Um, not necessarily a entirely um, just Samsung, but there were um, some remote controls from Sony and Panasonic that uh, the buttons didn't appear to actually do anything at all. Um, there was no voice control um, and also Every time you buy a Samsung device, um, you would get a remote control with it. Now, if you have a Samsung TV and a Samsung soundbar and other Samsung hi-fi objects, you can end up with a table full of remote controls. And because they've all got Samsung logos on them, you don't know which one's the TV, you don't know which one's the soundbar. So uh, that was another issue that we realized. Um, they did actually respond by putting the TV button up at the top. Um, but again, most users didn't spot this. Um, also, uh, one thing that other manufacturers had started doing was sticking Netflix buttons um, on their remote controls. However, because the amount of streaming services um, have, have sort of gone through the roof, especially over COVID, um, it seems as though it was favoring one system uh, over the others. And if you're a Amazon watcher, then a Netflix button is much used to you. Um, also, with the actual streaming services themselves, the remotes um, would vary the experience of using the TV remote control with streaming services tended to shift. So with Netflix, it seemed to work better, but with iPlayer, uh, it seemed to work really poorly. Um, also, on the actual TV itself, when you ac actually hit the menu button um, or the tools buttons on the remote itself, you would get very generic menu systems that would come up um, that you then have to kind of guess how you use those menus with the remote control. So a lot of users would simply start pressing around uh, in order to try and work out whether uh, a menu system was, was um, multi-page menu or single list view, um, and they didn't know. Uh, most, most users, when we asked them, said that they found that the actual layout and functionality of the menus themselves using the remote was confusing. So Samsung came up with what they call uh, the um, one remote. This um, is a universal remote. It controls any object in your house. Um, it controls any Samsung product uh, that has a remote control. Um, it can learn very quickly um, and it uses a bit of tech inside it to work out what it is that you're actually controlling. And if it's not, you can tell it and it'll learn. Um, they did stick the Netflix and the Prime video buttons on there, as you'll see. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether that was, um, was a great idea, but 
Um, they went on there because uh, they had a third button for an, another service that you could assign. Um, but in general, this was a universal remote that, that would um, work with anything. Um, it would accept voice commands. It would also read out um, in invoice uh, uh, objects on the screen. Um, it would have this as voice feedback to you. So if you turn these options on, it would tell you that you've just turned the channel up or down. Um, it would work across multiple device. Um, you could, it had a hot button that you could assign to anything that you wanted to. So if you were using a specific service, um, you press the hot button and it would activate that service. Um, they cut the amount of buttons down. Um, they tried to simplify it even further at one point, but um, they stuck with, um, I think, 11 objects actually in there with the scroll wheel. Um, it also had, uh, it's got an auto detector in it. So it uses a, a new form of um, sort of IR to measure what's in the room and, can, and will come up with commands on the TV to say, would you like to control this device um, with this remote? Um, it has app support, so you can um, access extra features on your mobile device. Um, it has a built-in voice guide that was that would appear on the TV with auto description. Um, it had a learn remote button, so you could actually pick up other remotes, um, get it to learn that remote uh, and take on board that, thing, that um, remote's functionality. It will also has a learn menu that when you activate it, it will bring it up inside the TV to teach you how to use the, um, uh, the, the actual uh, features of the remote control itself. Um, and then it, the other thing you do is you could um, invert the menus uh, in terms of colors uh, and um, it had dark mode. It would, you could um, change the contrast on the menus themselves. Uh, it also had a sign language uh, and a zoom feature and a whole bunch of accessibility shortcuts. So as you can see, this is a much more advanced object. Um, it's moved on and it's still got some flaws, but it's definitely an improvement over um, the old designs. If you actually um, buy one of these, you'll see that the learn remote um, functionality is built into the television where um, you will turn it on and it will actually walk you through all the features. Um, it'll speak to you when you press a button, either via the remote itself or from the television. Um, it'll teach you how to do things. So next time your nan wants to know how to access something, you can press the hot button and it will teach you how to actually use those features um, on the television itself. Um, the voice guide is a, another feature that they brought in that you can turn this on or turn it off, but it will effect effectively speak every button press and every um, change in setting to you. There is um, different uh, color modes that you could get. So people with um, color vision deficiencies would um, have a setting that they could tell the um, TV what condition they have and it will adjust um, the actual TV itself, the, the, the picture, um, and, and allow you to actually experience um, color as uh, um, somebody would not. And finally, there's um, the comfortable viewing mode, which was um, basically their response to the fact that a lot of menus are simply just big garish menus. Um, so you could invert them, you could have dark backgrounds, um, you could set it for depending on what your um, disability is. Um, and it's all split out, as you can see at the top here, vision, hearing and physical disabilities, um, just to make the entire device much more um, uh, accessible. And Samsung didn't see this as a, uh, as a sort of exercise in accessibility. They just saw it as a better design TV. Uh, when it was tested, the, the, the device, the, the remote control was seen as a significant step forward. Um, and it was actually given an award by the RNIB as being the most accessible television on the market. So um, thanks for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, um, 
let me know and I will hand back to Chris. Thank you, Phil. I think that's a great example of a company willing to invest in accessibility and seeing it as a general selling point. Uh, one of the challenges I had when working on the TV remote was I suggested um, a few of the features that were in your list um, and was told quite honestly by the product owner that there was a maximum unit cost that Vodafone were willing to spend and that some of these features just wouldn't be possible in the budget. The product was very much going to be a budget product and sadly that meant it was going to have a lower degree of accessibility. Um, that's pretty much yeah, all I can say about that. Uh, are there any questions from the um, from the audience? I did notice um, a, pre a presentation, I think last week that I was able to dip into. I believe one of the values of this is that Samsung have actually put some of these features into their telephones. So I think the color, the color changer feature, yeah, there's, I mean, the, 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 the reason why a lot of remote controls are actually um, such failed objects is because they were designed to one template. Um, and a lot of TV companies don't actually make their remote controls. They buy them prepackaged um, and then tweak them. Um, but with new 3D printing technology and, and stuff like, um, you know, the Raspberry Pi, tiny little computers, um, we were able to build different versions of things and, and just test them and realize the physicality of them and, and not have to mass produce thousands of them before we got something right. It was, it was very much a case of we're in, a, we're in an age now where the maker community is actually really driving this a lot. You can 3D print something, you can shove a Raspberry Pi in it and you can get it to control almost anything with relatively low levels of code so it's um it's a really good time to be involved with sort of physical um, electronic design, um, especially when it comes to the stuff that's that's just been sort of glossed over quite a lot. Were there any features that either through research or through, like I said, like I said, budgetary considerations or just technical limitations that you identified as things that would be useful for the user? but just weren't able to uh, get into the current generation of products? Um, I think the main thing was the fact that, um, that there was just a general reluctance to approach the, the, the topic itself. The, the, a lot of TV features that come out there try and expand the feature set of the television. And a classic example is 3D TV. Um, I never knew anybody who actually said they liked it. And a lot of people in the industry who were product reviewers just said it's not something, there was no real demand for it. It was, it was almost like a feature that was pushed onto users. Um, with this, what Samsung have done is actually create something that have, that have taken um, a, a section of their audience uh, and, and just made a better designed product. And as, as a result, people who are more elderly or they're unwell or they have um, some disability are now included in that set. And it's, it's not going to be um, you know, a barrier for them. And that, that number's actually pretty large. Uh, they, they were saying that um, there are more people um, with, uh, with uh, color blindness um, on the internet than there are people living in Spain. Um, I mean, you can imagine if someone was to say, well, we're going to make a TV, but people in Spain aren't allowed to buy it. Um, all hell would break loose. There are a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A panel. So um, Anita is asking, is there any kind of assessment that can be used to assess the accessibility of the product? Yeah, so in general, um, when we look at accessibility standards, we could go with something like WCAG, which is the... Um, the standard um, measurement for the internet or the web. Um, WCAG standards, especially the latest one, 2.2, have actually started bringing in um, much more accessibility marking for um, TVs and tablets. Um, previously, 
um, WCAG, which was single, double, or triple A standard rating, triple A being the best, um, was for browser-based technology. But the new standards actually take into um, consideration uh, TV user interfaces, um, tablet interfaces, and kiosk, which is the, another area that was originally ignored. So if you're wanting to know um, how you can check whether you're meeting just even single A st um, standards, um, look them up. They're, they're, there are different versions of them, but in general, the WCAG one is the one I recommend people sort of go with. Version 2.2 um, does have TV user interface requirements in there. And one thing I found is that if you search hard enough, there are there are standards for everything. So there are standards for accessible remote controls, uh, and I'm sure it's the same with many of the devices. I think just a final question because um, from Suki, um, where you, you mentioned with the remote that there were several features or functions that do similar things, or in, and indeed some buttons that were actually redundant. How? How would you suggest we try and uh, guide clients to focus on the core needs and simplify the feature set? And are there any frameworks that you know of that we can use to to guide this? Um, I mean, the, 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 there are quite a few um, instances of just general technologies that people don't like. You know, the, the remote control was was one that um, it, it's a problem that's been sitting around for years. People don't realise how old remote controls are. They're, they're from the fifties. And there's been lots of different versions of them and they were only really standardized um, around about the late 90s early 2000s um, and they've not changed since so at the moment um, if you're if you're actually getting into digital product design there there is a, a you know really great opportunity there to bring standards from um, established places like WCAG over into these new technologies um, and like I say, the maker community is really responding to this. Um, that they're making sure that when they build their prototypes, that they do include people with um, various disabilities in their testing groups, because only those users will be able to tell you what the reality of using the product is. And a lot of the time, um, UXs are very guilty of just um, you know, pulling a, a user set out of a box and saying, okay, I've built a new product. Um, I want to test um, it on 400 users, but they don't actually mark out the fact that I want to make sure at least 5% of my users have um, color blindness. They, they have some visual impairment. They have um, a physical disability. It's, it's not something that's mapped out in a lot of user testing. So it's mo much more a case of us as practitioners when we go to do our user testing to make sure that we're being inclusive to who's tested on some of the testing companies out there like user zoom when you go and um, request uh, an, an audience to test something they are starting now to include this uh, and like I say um, storybook which is a which is a UI component library tool does have settings in there where you can you know, simply select people with bad eyesight and it will blur the entire page. But in doing so, you'll be able to see which of the um, fonts on your screen um, aren't readable by people who simply don't have their glasses to hand. Thanks, Phil. So, um, right now I would have liked to introduce uh, Ian Hamilton. Unfortunately, um, this morning Ian advised us he was having some um, family issues. It's nothing serious, it's just that it meant he was unable to speak this evening. So uh, apologies for that. Um, like I say, we only found out um, after I think a second newsletter had gone out uh, this morning uh, and we did put it in the the email. I just wasn't able to announce it at the start because uh, Eden, Eden was joining us uh, from Israel and had a very um, a specific time slot that he could make. So really I just have a few closing comments. Uh, I could talk a little bit about games, but uh, I'm certainly not the expert. And as we are coming to the end of our scheduled time anyway, I just want to kind of finish with some closing th thoughts. I think sometimes as accessibility practitioners, we sometimes need to rethink accessibility and what we actually mean by that. 
So on the screen at the moment is, um, is an Amazon Echo Dot. So if you look at that device in isolation, uh, that device relies on speech input and audio output. So for anyone who is, um, has speech difficulties uh, or is Northern like me, and uh, it doesn't understand you, like uh, Phil said with Siri, it doesn't understand Scottish uh, accents, or you have an audio impairment, uh, a hearing impairment, sorry, then that device is, access is inaccessible to you. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't use it because there are a whole set of users who can really benefit from it, like non-visual users. And so you wouldn't say this product is inaccessible. And then what we need to think about is, okay, if I wanted to make that accessible, what would I do? Well, you'd have to have text input and text output. And really, something of that already exists. It's a tablet. And I think sometimes as accessibility practitioners or UX practitioners, we do spend a lot of time focusing on what's not there or what a product doesn't do rather than what a product can do. And I think we've seen with the talks uh, today, and I'm sure with the talks uh, last week, technology is a great enabler. And of course, at the end of the day, ultimately, you can just put everything together into one device. And then you have hopefully what is an accessible solution for a, a wide range uh, of people. So again, apologies, we weren't able to have Ian speak on uh, games. We are going to look at how we can either share um, a talk that he was going to give, or we'll certainly look to schedule a gaming event uh, and have him, because I realise some of you may have joined. Uh, apologies, he was unavailable to speak. It just at short notice, I wasn't able to arrange a replacement. So I'd like to wish you um, a happy after party for Global Accessibility Wednesday. I see some familiar names in the participants panel, so it was great to uh, see you join and keep an eye on our newsletter for our next event. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, thanks to our captioner, Kate, and uh, good night, everyone. Thanks a lot.